let's take a look at Impact Wrestling over the past week. We had an Impact leading up to Hard to Kill and then the Hard to Kill pay-per-view itself. Last week I talked about how I've been enjoying Impact again as of late. I do feel like it has found its footing again. I feel like it's gaining some momentum. I think a lot of the creativity has paid off. I've seen some positive reactions to the Hard to Kill pay-per-view online, both on social media, Reddit, internet forums. It seems like Impact Wrestling has gained some new fans as of late and some fans returning to the product after a long while. And I can see why. We're going to mostly discuss the Hard to Kill pay-per-view today. I'll go over the matches and what I think about them. There was two booking decisions that I disagreed with, but I still felt like overall, just like the solid build to Hard to Kill, the event itself was also very solid. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Impact episode from January 12th. I don't have much to say, it was just more build to the pay-per-view. We did have the main event, the six-man tag, which if anybody doesn't know me by now, most six-man tag matches I absolutely loathe because most of them are, they're just, why even have them? They're just pointless waste of time. There's hardly any stories that lead to most of them. So I'm not a big fan of six-man tag matches, but this one did at least have a point where we got to see Moose pin Joe Hendry, giving him his first loss since he returned to Impact Wrestling. The thing on the episode of Impact that didn't really have a anything to do with the Hard to Kill pay-per-view was the Sammy Callahan story with him getting his hair cut. The story still hasn't made a lot of sense to me. But they had Sammy Callahan cut his hair so he could kind of be stripped of his former self. Uh, Cody Diener was comparing it to Samson, cutting his hair to lose his strength. I mean, it was a, it was a bit much for me. I, I wish it would make a little more sense, but I don't feel like the storyline is making a lot of sense to me. I don't know how Sammy Callahan, how we're supposed to think about him, that he is almost turned face, but now he wants to join the design, who is a hill group. I'm sure there's a twist coming, but I'm going to need it to come sooner rather than later because this segment, it, fa it failed. It was a fail of a segment. It was awkward just watching him cut his hair. Yeah, not a big fan. But let's get to the actual hard to kill pay-per-view. We're going to first start with the X Division Championship match on the pre-show Trey Miguel versus Black Taurus. It was a, you know, a typical X Division match. We got to see Trey Miguel having to cheat multiple times to win this match and regain his title. But I like that we we got to see more from Trey Miguel in that aspect, being a cheater. I liked it. But then to start the main show, I was surprised at first that they were starting with the Impact World title match, a full Metal Mayhem match. I mean, they're starting it with all of the, the bells and whistles here, with it being Bully Ray versus Joss Alexander going hardcore, going extreme right off the bat. Bully Ray was uh, really being able to take advantage of Joss Alexander in this hardcore match. First, he attacked him from behind before the match even started, so that gave him the advantage. But the biggest thing to me and why this feud worked for me and why this match worked for me is that it did tell a story we we saw for months really but i guess we'll say several weeks bully ray threatening people bullying people he will almost hurt joss alexander's wife then we saw him turn on tommy dreamer and all of that so we we had Bully Ray and his lackeys during the build, too, and the lackeys were involved in this match, as well as Tommy Dreamer, and as well as Joss Alexander's wife. So they tied in everybody into this chaos of a match that was involved in the story, and it was Joss's wife that really helped Joss Alexander get this uh, win when she low-blowed Bully Ray. And Bully Ray takes a loss, Joss Alexander regains the Impact World title, and this match worked because the story worked. It was one of the matches I was looking forward to and it delivered to me. I don't know where they go with Bully Ray from here, but I'm sure he'll figure out a way to continue to make his storyline work. And Josh Alexander can hopefully move on to something interesting as well as the world champion. 
Next up was the Impact Tag Team 4-Way Motor City Machine Guns versus Heath and Rhino versus the Major Players versus Ace Austin and Chris Bay. This had too many teams in it to be anything good. I think by the time we got to the final two teams, it became a little better. This was just not my favorite match of the night. I was happy Motor City Machine Guns retained, but to me, this was my least favorite match of the night, to be honest. Even over the... Well, we'll get to it. We did see at the end of this, though, Frankie Kazarian returning to Impact, an Impact original back in the day, TNA. Looks like he's gone from AEW and coming to Impact, which is good because AEW wasn't doing anything with Frankie Kazarian. I'm sure he will have plenty to do in Impact, so we'll see if he can make an Impact starting here soon. The Impact Digital Media Championship, Joe Hendry versus Moose, another match I was looking forward to. It became a battle of strength and power, both of them hitting uh, some power moves on each other, showing off their strength at times. Moose ending up having to cheat to win, but then we saw the new Director of Authority, Santino Morala, comes to Impact Wrestling as the new Director of Authority, restarts the match uh, because of the cheating, and then Hendry picks up the win to regain his title after all of that. The big story here being Santino Morale is now an Impact. I'm sure he will continue to be his comedy character self. I used to really enjoy Santino back in the day in the WWE. He always entertained me. Uh, his first promo here wasn't that funny, but I think they can use him to give us some, some entertaining television at times, I expect. Hopefully it doesn't get go too far into the comedy realm, but I think it will, because it's Santino Morala. I do find it funny that he, they must have picked up the copyright from WWE, though. That must have lapsed, so that's pretty fun. But Santino works with Impact Wrestling a lot with his uh, training. So I think I like the story here. I like the match. I thought I enjoyed the power moves between Moose and Hendry. The build to this was funny because I find Joe Hendry funny. But we'll see where they go with all three of these people. I don't know where Moose goes from here. He needs a big win going forward. I feel like he's definitely fallen in Impact, which is also, it's honestly my biggest gripe with Impact Wrestling. I do feel like once you're out of momentum on Impact, you really fall hard. Which actually brings me to the Knockouts number one contender match. It was Diana Perrazzo versus Killer Kelly versus Masha Slamovich versus Taylor Wilde. Also down there with the tag matches, with the tag match. The, these were the only two matches in the card that weren't my favorite. The reason this one wasn't my favorite, it's not that the match was that bad. It's the result that doesn't make a lot of sense for me. And this is one of my first booking issues of the night for Impact. Masha Slamovich winning to become number one contender after the last two months doing a lot of losing after she was already built up well before that. Like she was built up well to get the knockout title shot and then lost that match. And then since then she's been doing a lot of losing, but now just because she wins the number one contender match, I'm supposed to be excited about her being the number one contender after all that. I'm not. The Falls Count Anywhere, Rich Swan versus Steve Macklin. I mean, it was what it was. It was kind of a throwback to the Attitude Era hardcore matches where they started the match outside of the arena. It, it was fun. It was what it was. Macklin was probably always going to win this match. It was, it was just okay. The next match was pretty great, though, because any Jonathan Gresham match is pretty great. He took on Eddie Edwards. Uh, Gresham is fun to watch. I do like watching his matches a lot. Uh, I kind of expected him to win this, but he lost it. This was another gripe with my booking. Because Eddie Edwards, to me, is pretty played out. I've seen him run the gamut at Impact Wrestling. Like, I've only watched Impact off and on over the last three years. But I've seen a lot of Eddie Edwards in every single angle possible, it feels like. So Eddie getting the win here, I would rather something more fresh in Gresham getting the win, but that didn't happen. So uh, hopefully they have something creative planned that will be interesting enough. But we ended the night with the knockout title match. What made this match work so great were the stakes. Anytime a match has a stake like this so high, with the possibility of it being Mickey James' last match if she loses, 
and it's seeming like a real possibility because it seems like her career was winding down she's taking on the powerful champion jordan grace here and this was good stuff the the match told a story they had the right near falls i hate when a match has too many near falls it just overdoes it this had the right amount of near falls and because of the stipulation you, you didn't really know what was going to happen which is one of my biggest complaints in AEW, if anybody listened to my last AEW uh, video. But Mickey James wins the match, becomes the knockout champion again. Her career is not over. I wish she wasn't going to be feuding with Masha Slamovich, if that's going to be her next opponent, because as I already said, I didn't like the booking of that or the booking of her lately. But overall, I did like Hard to Kill a lot. A solid event. Uh, I still, after this, feel like Impact still has that wave of momentum going on. I hope they are able to keep up with that because AEW has some great dynamites, but like I said, that roster is so bloated and their other smaller shows are a waste of time. In WWE, you have to watch so many shows to really keep up with it, whereas on Impact, it's just one show a week and usually one big event a month. It's easy to keep up with, and I think the roster right now is actually a good one. So, like I said, I saw on social media and message boards and Reddit, this event brought some new fans to Impact Wrestling, and hopefully they can continue to build that momentum, maybe bring up their ratings a little bit. That's been struggling over the past couple of years on Access TV. But I like what I've been seeing at Impact, and I look forward to see what they do over this next month.